Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, where we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and where we support each other on our spiritual search for truth and meaning. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I am so glad that you are here this morning. Welcome to those of you in the room, and welcome also to those of you joining us via our live stream. Today's service is called Lessons from Lima Beans. But before we begin, I have just a few announcements to share. First, I want to welcome and thank John Thomas on piano. John Thomas was already filling in for Mary, directing the choir, and then just this morning, about an hour ago, learned that he would also be filling in for Brenda. So we thank John so much. And also, if you could keep on your hearts, Brenda and her father, uh, her elderly father, who she cares for at home, isn't doing well today, so that's where she is. I want to remind you that our winter spirituality series is starting up in February. You can find all of the information about that on our website and check your email inboxes and look for the handouts on the welcome table to tell you more about all of those offerings. But they do include a workshop about creating a legacy from everyday life, soul collage cards, a labyrinth walk, a death cafe, and also an event called Singspiration on February 25th. We'll be hosting all of the other churches in town for a hymn sing and a fun day of gathering in the warmth of this sanctuary to sing together across all of our traditions. We are in the process of updating our member directory. So Stan and Ada are here today, and during coffee hour, there's Ada and Stan is out back, there he is. During coffee hour, you can see them to update anything that might have changed for you in the last year. Uh, if you want a new picture taken, you can ask Ada and she can do that for you today. We have actually decided to take our directory down from our website. You know, it was password protected, but there have been all these phishing schemes. It's really too bad. Uh, but we want your information to be properly protected. So um, we will be emailing you a PDF of the new directory when it's ready. And in the meantime, if you need a PDF of the old directory, you can contact Kenneth in the office and he can get that to you. Circle suppers are starting up again. These are small potluck dinners in members' homes. Our first one is going to be on Saturday, February 24th. So if you would like to either host a potluck or come to a potluck, please sign up with Lisa during coffee hour or you can email her. We'll be sending out emails about this too. And we've just picked a date for Betty Comey Cricket's memorial service. So we hope you can join us for her celebration of life on March 3rd. That's a Sunday. We're going to do it in the afternoon after service. We'll be sending more information about that too. I hope that those of you who are here in person can join us after the service for a coffee and conversation downstairs in Acker Bosworth Hall. And now let's take a moment to affirm our community's covenant. You can find this on the little purple laminated cards in your pews, or you can just listen as I say it line by line. I invite you to repeat each line after me. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace. To seek the truth in love. And to help one another. And now, as we light our chalice here in the sanctuary, I invite those of you watching from home to light a candle wherever you are. In that way, we can feel connected even while we are apart. And this morning, I invite Vicki and Lee to light our chalice.
Our chalice lighting words this morning are by Richard Gilbert. Each morning, we hold out the chalice of our being to receive, to carry, to give back. Won't you please join me now in singing our opening hymn. This is actually my favorite hymn. We had a little go-round at a meeting I was at the other day where we said our favorite hymn. And this is mine, number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth. It's in this gray hymnal. That's number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth. Please rise as you are able. seated. I invite you now into a time of meditation and prayer. During this time or at any time during the service, you are welcome to light a silent candle at the table to the right of the pulpit where there is a journal to record your thoughts and prayers. After the prayer, we'll Enter with me that still place within, the center, where we find not only our inmost selves, but also our connection to the farthest reaches of the universe. Here we confront our aspirations and our failings, though we seek always for our lives to be full of goodness we sometimes lack the courage to right the injustices that confront us. Though we seek to be generous, always, sometimes our fears cause us to be greedy. Though we seek always to walk the moral high ground, sometimes we judge others too quickly and too harshly. 
though we seek always to understand the larger mysteries, sometimes doubt causes us to lose faith in our purpose. Here in this space made sacred by our shared lives and our shared yearnings, may we find new courage, new generosity of spirit, forgiveness given and received, and rededication to the higher purposes of our lives. Amen. Our first reading today is by Richard Van Camp. Um, may we have enough to share. And the photos are photographs provided by members of T and Bannock, which is a collective blog by indigenous women photographers. So I invite you to look up close at the pictures later. I'm going to show them to the camera right now. May we have enough to share. 
May we have enough to share, to know the sweetness of every day. May we have enough to share our homes, our food, our stories, our laughter. May we have enough snuggles, kisses, hugs, and sniffs. May we also have hugs to warm each other's hearts. May the success and joy that we see inspire our own dreams and wishes. May we have enough to lighten each other's sorrows. May we have enough to help. May we have enough to explore life's sweet mystery around us every day. May we have room to grow and be ourselves. May we have enough to honor each other and pray for the healing of Mother Earth. May we know love. Thank you. Won't you join me in singing our next hymn, also in this gray hymnal, number 128, For All That Is Our Life. That's number 128, For All That Is Our Life. Please rise as you are able. be seated. This morning's second reading is Choose to Bless the World by Rebecca Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power 
the strength of the hands, the reach of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question, what will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It's an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting, that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude, to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community, the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, the chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possible waiting. Thank you. Now is the time in our service where we take a collection for the ongoing support of this meeting house and our shared ministry. As we enjoy a musical reflection by our choir, we welcome your donations.
Thank you. Jim B. Woodard told this story at a moth story slam. He called it food for thought. In his adult life, Jim is a devout atheist, but he has fond memories of going to church as a kid. There was always some kind of food drive going on, he remembers. Before church, his mom or dad would hand him a canned good to bring with him. And as part of the service, the children would be invited up to the chancel at the front of the sanctuary, and they would all put their food items into a big box, and the minister would bless it. It was a nice way for kids to learn about giving and taking care of others, Jim says. And as I said, usually his parents would give him and his sister something to put in the box. But one day, when they were getting a little bit older, his dad told them to go to the pantry themselves and pick out their own items to donate. Pick what you would like to give to a family in need, his dad said. Now this was suburbia in the 1970s, so Jim's family had like a wall full of canned goods and mac and cheese and other easy to grab meals all lined up on the shelves. Right away, Jim spotted a can of mandarin oranges. Jim was all about mandarin oranges. He loved them so much, he would open up a can and eat the whole thing by himself. So when he saw that, he kind of slid those to the side. (laughs) And then he came upon a honking can of veg all. Jim hated veg all. Canned vegetables were never delicious, but this particular blend of mixed vegetables had lima beans in it. It was disgusting. It was perfect. (laughs) He grabbed the can for donation. Meanwhile, his sister was having her own parallel process. She picked creamed corn, the thing she hated the most. That's what you want to bring to the family in need, their father asked before they left for church. Yup, they said. (laughs) And off to church they went. When the children were called to the front, they brought the cans of veg all and creamed corn up the center aisle and placed them in the box to be blessed by the minister. Sundays were a family day at Jim's house. After church, their grandparents would come over. They would have Sunday dinner together. That Sunday, Jim's mom had made a roast chicken. The house smelled so good. When they sat down to eat, Jim waited eagerly for his plate. But as it turns out, that afternoon, Jim and his sister were not served any of the roast chicken and crispy potatoes that the rest of the family was eating. Instead, their dad brought over plates just for them. His sister was given a bowl of creamed corn. Jim was given a plate a veg all. It wasn't a punishment exactly. They weren't shamed publicly at church. But his dad asked them a simple question as he I think of that story when I think about generosity. It's not just a question of do we give or how much we are giving. It's a question of From what place does our giving come? Are we giving what we would like to receive? 
The word generous comes from the Latin generosus, Mark Ewart says in his book, The Generosity Path. Generosus means noble, magnanimous. Magnanimous, in turn, comes from the Latin words magnu, great, and animus, soul. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, generous means freely giving more than is necessary or expected. Freely giving more than is necessary or expected. So generosity includes this idea of open-handedness, but also a connection to our own spirit and spirituality. It's not just about what we give, but how we want to be in the world. Generosity's rich meaning can inspire us, Mark says. It implies giving freely, so the giver holds choice and control. And freedom always feels good. It's about giving more than is necessary, so it's not limited by being required or indispensable. It's more than expected, so it goes beyond the obligation to give or what is anticipated by the recipient. Finally, generosity ennobles us, he says. It makes us great souls. Who would not want to feel that they are a generous person? Compare this to words like charity, alms, and aid, Mark says, which label the recipient as poor. Compare it to donation or contribution, which are cold, technical terms, and grant, which is formal legalese. Mark prefers the word philanthropy. Instead of Latin, this one comes from Greek. It means loving humankind, philanthropy. It's a shame that this word has come to imply a rare few who have the wealth and power to be philanthropists, Mark says. He thinks it's time to redefine the term and make it available to everyone, regardless of their resources. You, no matter your level of income or financial worth, can be a philanthropist, he says, if you can figure out how to love the world. We get stuck sometimes when we think about giving. We get stuck on thinking it's just about money. And we get stuck sometimes thinking we don't have enough for ourselves to give some of our precious resources away. We want to give from our excess rather than from our abundance. What would it take for us to see our lives as abundant? What would it take for us to see ourselves as having gifts to share? Can we separate that feeling from the numbers on our bank account? If you come into any situation feeling that the world is a beautiful place, Mark says, and that you have been given many valuable things during your lifetime, you may feel more secure in yourself and your resources. The inner warmth you feel from this gratitude will open a channel in your heart through which gifts to other people can flow. To develop your generosity, he says, Remember that in spite of its problems, this planet is an incredible gift to us all. It provides sustenance, sensual pleasure, and infinite variety. We are surrounded by this beauty, which is ever-changing and recurring, so we can experience familiar pleasures over and over again. Pleasures are just as unavoidable as suffering, he says. 
And these two opposites create the balance of life. Our birth was a fortunate gift. Our bodies and minds are miraculous systems that allow us to create, understand, calculate, and dream. In fact, each person is born with the ability to seek and find satisfaction no matter their circumstances. Without reason or cause, people love us, and we love other people, friends, parents and children, spouses or partners. And we are the beneficiaries of generations of inventors and designers who have created wonderful processes and objects that make our lives easier, more comfortable, more pleasurable. Millions of thinkers and teachers have gone before us, and we are the inheritors of that knowledge. We are so blessed. We are so interconnected. How do we remember that? How do we give from that place of blessing and connection? A few years ago, Bill Docker lent me a book called Mind Hacking by John Hargrave. The premise of this book is that we can train our minds to behave differently. We can view the mind objectively, John said, not getting caught up in content, distracted by our particular thoughts. In other words, we can become aware of our own minds. And then, when we are more aware of our brains working, we can train them, hack them, change those thoughts in an intentional way. I was intrigued by the idea that there were exercises one could do for the mind that could then, with practice, turn into habits. What we're targeting is the unnecessary distractions, the interruptions that we allow into our lives, either out of habit, ignorance, or laziness, John said. I wonder if these same training techniques can be applied not just to our concentration, but to our generosity. Can we hack our hearts to become more generous people? Can we interrupt the giving patterns that we practice out of habit, ignorance, or laziness? And maybe the ones that have developed because of a scarcity mentality as well. The book offers something called the habit loop. In order to cultivate a positive habit, you need to consciously set up a cue to begin as well as a reward when complete. Choose a consistent time. Choose a consistent place. Choose a consistent reminder and choose a consistent reward. This is how we train ourselves. What would that look like if we were training ourselves to be more generous? What if each time we have the thought, I don't have enough, we use that as the cue to practice generosity? Each time we think, I don't have enough, we consciously decide to be generous to the very next person we encounter. We offer a smile to a stranger. We say hello when normally we would just pass by. We put a dollar in the busker's cap. We give a family member the benefit of doubt. We practice being generous with our body language, our time, our thoughts. I don't know what the reward will be, but I'm pretty certain there will be one. And what about being generous to ourselves? Is that something we can practice? 
Beginning your day with some fulfilling self-care will build your balance and clarity so that you're more able to address what you encounter during the day, Mark says. That might be a few minutes staying in your warm, cozy bed before starting the day. It could mean prayer or meditation first thing in the morning, or a walk to see the dawning light and smell the morning air. Mornings are often times of rushing and frustration, so be gentle and create joy for yourself by finding a way to be gracious. It will color the rest of your day. Your loops create your thoughts, John says. Your thoughts create your actions. Your actions create your life. The quality of our loops determines the quality of our lives. How are we going to train ourselves? Train yourself towards solidarity, not charity, activist Brittany Packett says. You are no one's savior. You are a mutual partner in the pursuit of freedom. Brittany is the co-founder of Campaign Zero, which works to end police violence which she began after the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson. Brittany wrote an article in New York Magazine called How to Spend Your Privilege. In it, she tells the story of Naya and Latifah Grayson, who were waiting for the BART train in Oakland when they were attacked by John Cowell, a 27-year-old white man. Latifah survived, but Naya later died from her injuries. After Naya's death, the outcry among black Americans was swift and loud. There were vigils and protests. Her family demanded that her story be told and her name be said. After Naya's death, black feminist Rachel Cargill urged white women to stand up for her. I'm waiting for your fave white feminist to post about Naya Wilson, she wrote. Some white feminists got defensive. Instead of doing what had been asked of them, they boasted about how much they had done for black people, asking prominent black voices to back them up. If you're looking for a clear example of how not to spend your privilege, that's it, Brittany says. When a black woman asks for solidarity, don't react with defensiveness. Practice solidarity, not charity. Solidarity came from an unexpected source the actress Anne Hathaway posted on Instagram, urging white people to focus on Naya's death. White people, including me, including you, she said, must take into the marrow of our privileged bones the truth that black people fear for their lives daily in America and have done so for generations. We must ask our white selves, how decent are we, really? Not in our intent, but in our actions, in our lack of action. I'm sure Anne Hathaway's 12.2 million followers did not expect to see her posting about Nia Wilson, Brittany says. Perhaps she made some of her fans uncomfortable or even lost followers, spending one's privilege can carry consequences. But nothing important comes without risk, and it's worth taking one in the name of justice. Do as Anne did, 
and begin to spend your privilege, Brittany says. You didn't earn it, so give it away. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time, Aboriginal activist Lila Watson once said. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. We are so interconnected. How do we remember that? How do we give from that place of blessing and connection? At its most personal level, Mark Ewart says, generosity is about being present with other people. Part of our generosity may include dropping our biases and seeking authentic fellowship with those we hope to help. I keep thinking about that word philanthropy, loving humankind. Maybe the question of generosity is not how much money can we give. Maybe the question is, what will we do with our gifts? Can we tra train ourselves to be more generous? Are we willing to spend our privilege? Are we dealing out veg all? Or are we giving out mandarin oranges? Can we practice loving this world? Amen and blessed be. <clears throat> it has become our practice to pose a question based on the theme of the service each week. It can be a topic of sharing at coffee hour today or with friends during the week. If you'd like to delve deeper into this question, we invite you to join us at our Zoom coffee hour on Tuesday evening at 5 p.m. Please contact the office if you need that link. Our question this week is, tell us about a time someone was generous with you. Tell us about a time Someone was generous with you. May we have enough to share, to know the sweetness of every day. May we have enough to share our food, our stories, our laughter. May we have enough to lighten each other's sorrows. May we have enough to explore life's sweet mystery around us every day. May we know and may we practice love. And before we leave today, I'd like to try something. You all were very generous with us when we passed the offering bags earlier to support the work of this faith community. And now, during the postlude, we are going to take part in another offering. But this one is a reverse offering. You who are here in person will receive an envelope with money in it. The instructions are simple. Love the world with it. Maybe you'll receive a dollar. If the person next to you receives $20, practice not being upset. <laughs> practice blessing the world with your dollar that you did not have a moment ago. Maybe you'll put it in the busker's cap on your way to the car. If you receive $5, maybe you'll buy someone a cup of coffee. 
If you receive $100, maybe you'll slip it into a tip jar or give it to your favorite justice organization or buy a case of peanut butter for the little free pantry. There are no rules and no one will be checking up on you to see how you spent the money. If you are in need, keep it. If you aren't, pass it on. Go in peace.